December 15th, 1987. Okay, I know you were born in New York on July 12th, 1913, mm -hmm. but I know almost nothing else about your early life, and so maybe you can tell me a little bit about your family. My father was a renegade rabbi. He left Russia in about 1907 or thereabouts. My father and my mother knew each other in Europe. They were childhood sweethearts. My mother was born in 1913 in the Bronx. And for the first 13 years of her life, she lived in an apartment in the Bronx. And then at age 13, uh, her father moved the family to a Yiddish-speaking cooperative. The Yiddish cooperative Heim Gesellschaft was founded as one of the country's first housing cooperatives and dedicated itself to the preservation of Yiddish culture. The residents of this two-block apartment colony define themselves by their very progressive values, namely education, the arts, and a deep commitment to social justice. In fact, the co-op's mission of collectivism opened its doors to families of otherwise limited means, like the Cones, and inspired a future of great possibility. That's where I grew up, and we had all kinds of activities there, cultural activities. You know, everyone had a little Misha or Sasha who either played the violin and painted, and we had clubs of all kinds. In addition to rich cultural pursuits, the radical politics of the cooperative fueled Mildred's idealism, and prepared her to forge a mindful and unique path in the world. The co-op is when my mother's world just uh, exploded. It was in some ways the most exciting time of her life. It's when my mother realized, I think, that there was a life of the mind. She realized that there was a world of ideas that could sustain you. I was a very bright little girl, I suppose, and also the schools were very crowded, so they kept skipping me all the time. I graduated from high school when I was 14. With the nation in the grip of the Great Depression, and only 10% of women across the entire country enrolled in college, Mildred's continued success in school was just another sign of her fortitude. There was no question in her mind that she was going to college, no question whatsoever. And because her family was of extremely limited means, she was going to go to Hunter College, which was free for women. I had taken chemistry for two years in high school, and I liked it very much. And at college, I initially intended to be a chemistry major, but then I, I was interested in everything, and I couldn't make up my mind. But I decided that I could study other things by myself, but the science I would have to study formally at the college. Mildred majored in chemistry with other hardworking Hunter students and flourished in the program. Yet as she neared graduation, it seemed a teaching career was being molded for her, and Mildred had different plans. My mother's father was her greatest supporter. So he gave her this very interesting message, which is, Mildred, you are capable of doing anything that you choose, but you've got to be realistic. You are female, and you are a Jew, and that is something that you are going to have to navigate. You're going to have to 
somehow figure out a way to get around the kind of discrimination that you're going to encounter. I had the vague idea that if I got a PhD, I could do research. I really didn't know whether it would be in industry or academia or in a government laboratory. I was really very ignorant. Most of her family was opposed to her becoming a chemist, a research chemist. Her mother wanted her to be a school teacher. Mildred entered Columbia University in 1931 for graduate school in chemistry, working at a department store and as a camp counselor to earn the $300 tuition. In just a year, she'd earned her master's degree, which fueled her ambition for further education. Yet Mildred met a number of obstacles and prejudices. Unable to afford more schooling, Mildred took her degree and found her first job at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics in Virginia. She was the only woman at the plant. She had never been out of New York City, basically. So now she's in Tidewater, Virginia. Well, she might as well have been in the heart of Africa as far as she was concerned. It was completely foreign to her, the culture there, people's worldview, and so on. But true to Mildred's style, she landed on her feet. Mildred eventually became a fuel injection chemist of the NACA, the predecessor to NASA. The big honcho from Washington, the director of the entire agency, came and he saw Mildred in the lab, which apparently for him was a no-no. So he writes this memo saying that there are not to be women in the lab. And as my mother comments on, this was because women were a distraction. You never know what would happen to the male scientists if there was a woman in the lab. What's fascinating is in her memoir, when she writes about this incident, she can't believe, as she says, her own chutzpah. She was only 20 years old at the time. She goes to her boss and she says to him, if I'm not allowed to do research in the lab, I'll design the experiments and perhaps you can find someone, you know, one of these male uh, colleagues of mine, and they can be like my my surrogate in the lab. To her amazement, her boss says, okay. After being inspired by engineering at the NACA and earning enough for tuition, Mildred returned to Columbia to finish her PhD in physical chemistry. Always aligning herself with progressive thinkers, Mildred pursued lab work with Harold Urey, a Nobel laureate. He was convinced she wouldn't want this position as, in his words, he paid no attention to his graduate students. Mildred persisted, true to form, and got what she wanted. Nobel-level research opportunities, and the freedom to pursue her own interests. I've worked with many of the greats. Almost everyone I've ever worked with is a Nobel laureate. But of them all, Yuri had the fastest mind. During her time at Columbia, Mildred met another influential figure, this time in a physics course, her future husband, Henry Primakoff. My father was a theoretical physicist, and his career was focused on the study of elementary particles. He was a scientific peer of my mother's in his own field. What she says about my father is not only was he intelligent, actually, I'll tell you what I think. Not only was he intelligent, he made her laugh. He was extremely witty. He was extremely clever. They had so much in common culturally, intellectually, philosophically, politically. They were soulmates. When she was at Columbia, I mean, this is the Depression. The job market is non-existent. The recruiters from industry, which is a major employer for a chemist, would come and they would post in no uncertain terms, male Christians only. Armed with a PhD in an inhospitable job environment, Mildred sought work elsewhere and found a position in the lab of one of Yuri's colleagues, Dr. Vincent Davigno, who at first refused to hire a woman. They told him I was the only one in the country who was qualified. Now, that wasn't so far from the truth. Because she was the only physical chemist on his team, early on arriving and throughout the time that she was there, she built apparatus. He would ask her sometimes to repair things, he would ask her to build things, and she built her first mass spectrometer. 
A mass spectrometer essentially weighs molecules by passing them through an electromagnetic field. And Mildred built one, something her male colleagues were unable to do. This fueled her interest in understanding chemical reactions at the atomic level and continued a long career defined by innovation and technology. I had two children while I was working for the vineyard. It was not easy because my first two children were born during World War II, and to get domestic help of any kind was very difficult. I did it, but it wasn't easy. When she was at work, when she was at the lab, she was fully engaged, and I think she had to have been a very efficient person in the lab. She used every minute well. When she was at home, she was not thinking about work. So she compartmentalized work and home. So Davinio had a team, and my mother was part of that team. The impression I have is that she learned a tremendous amount scientifically, but much to her dismay and frustration, she did not get to do her own independent research. Looking to move on with her career, Mildred encouraged her husband to accept a new teaching appointment at Washington University in St. Louis, giving her the perfect opportunity to accept a research position in the School of Medicine's biochemistry lab. Being a woman of uncompromising ambition, Mildred allied herself again with the brightest minds, working this time with Nobel Prize winners Carl Corey and his wife Gertie Corey, the first American woman to earn the honor. But I hadn't come to St. Louis to be uh, someone else's assistant for the rest of my life. So I, I started a new field of research there, uh, which turned out to be fairly successful. Here, Mildred set up a radioactive isotope laboratory and built another mass spectrometer. This enterprising habit, simply creating an instrument or material she didn't have, earmarked Mildred's spectacular career. Her research led to groundbreaking work in nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR, the technology that makes MRIs possible. The place was just so stimulating. I think six people who passed through that laboratory have gotten Nobel Prizes. And most of the rest are in the National Academy. I mean, it was fantastic, the kind of people who were there, so it was very lively. We used to have lunch together every day. Any topic could be talked about, it needn't be science at all. Washington University had been Mildred's launch pad for truly original work, and she continued to pursue research opportunities wherever they led her. In 1960, Mildred and Henry moved to Philadelphia for permanent teaching appointments at the University of Pennsylvania, where she'd spend the next 22 years of her career. Mildred was a tiny woman. She was very small. But when she walked into the room, it was very clear that she filled the place up. And everybody treated her with the utmost respect. I had read about her work on the structure of ATP and the pioneering work that she had done with P31 NMR. She was really renowned in the field. I was thrilled to find her because um, well, for a number of reasons. She turned out to be a fabulous mentor. She was an incredibly warm person, um, but she was also very demanding, scientifically demanding. And I knew if I was going to show her data, I had better be able to answer a lot of questions about that data, and I had better have planned the next logical experiment. <laughs> She was very generous with her ideas. People loved to talk to her about their science because she would just give them ideas. I, I do have these memories of when I was younger and she brought us to her lab and it was the first time I'd ever been on Penn's campus and I just thought it was the coolest thing. And you know, showing us the things that we would think were really cool. I'm not sure how old I was at the time, probably uh, third, fourth grades, but we made books about our heroes. So I wrote mine about my grandma. I drew pictures of 
when I went to visit the lab and of my grandma in the lab and it just made a really big impression on me. In 1983, Mildred's husband Henry died after a long illness. That was quite a blow. We'd been married 45 years, and uh, he had always been very supportive. I always said that uh, the luckiest thing I ever did was marry a man who really believed that I should have a career. I mean, he didn't just play lip service to that, he really meant it. for her 90th birthday celebration. She had requested to have her children arrange for her to go hang gliding. And the flight lasted probably 15 or 20 minutes. And her comment upon landing was that it was great. She wished it had lasted much longer. She just, uh, she could have stayed up there forever. I think that my mother's scientific career was marked by serendipity combined with talent and persistence. There are sort of two pillars of what I think guided her as a person and as a scientist, which I think she really learned from her own father. And that is the principle of social justice and the valuing of learning and of, if one is able, making a contribution to the store of human knowledge. I've had a very successful and satisfying career. It's been fun. Thank you.